Hi, everyone. Um, I have someone I want you guys to meet. Her name is Stacy Urig. Um, Stacy does a very innovative special type of therapy with people called RTT, and she is here to tell you guys all about it. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for Hi, joining us. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Amazing. So first, um, how you became a life coach and then what made you decide to learn about RTT therapy? So I couldn't hear the beginning. Did you say what made me become a life coach? Yeah. Oh, so, you know, I think just like a lot of coaches, maybe including yourself, we come to it as a true calling. So for me, um, I'm 50 years old. And when I was 12, I had some really traumatic things happen to me in my life. And they kind of continued on for many years. And I ended up in therapy as a young child at 15 and kind of endured therapy on and off for 35 years. And, you know, I gained a lot of what I like to term post-traumatic wisdom. And I was naturally somebody that people would just be drawn to when they were in challenge. And I actually loved it. Like I loved working and helping people and giving them a different lens through which to see their challenge. Mm -hmm. And I had another business. And during that business, I had a, a massive opportunity to mentor a lot of people. And I just really found that that was the thing that drove me the most. And so I decided that I should formalize that. So I did so by becoming a life coach and opening a life coach practice. And, you know, ultimately with the RTT, which is rapid transformational therapy, I, I can't think of a client that I didn't sit with that always asked why, why do I do this? Why do I think this? Why, why don't I see myself the way other people see me? Why do I have this habit? Why do I have this issue with self-esteem, confidence, whatever it was, there was always this why, and we could always talk through it. And we used a very specific model to do so, but I always found that there was probably a deeper root reason cause for the why. Mm -hmm. And I came across um, in my studies, a woman named Marissa Peer. And Marissa is a psychotherapist. And for 30 years, she developed this rapid transformational therapy and was now allowing other people to get trained in it as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I did my due diligence. I did some deep diving, realized this could actually be the best way for me to answer that why for my clients. So I went through that program and that yielded me two certifications. One is a rapid transformational therapy practitioner and the other is a certified hypnotherapist. Um, rapid transformational therapy is not straight up hypnotherapy. It's a combination of that with neurolinguistic programming, cognitive behavioral therapy, neuroscience, but we do use hypnosis as a way to get somebody into a relaxed state so they can get to the root of the why. Where does the root of the why exist in someone? In your subconscious. So the, the benefit of um, hypnosis is that when you're in hypnosis and all that hypnosis is, is just a very, very deepened, relaxed state very similar okay. to if you were driving somewhere and you forgot how you got there, or if you were watching a movie and were just in deeply entranced in the movie, you're awake, but you're just, your conscious mind is not really there at the moment. So all of our emotions are set in our subconscious and all of our core beliefs come from our emotions. And so when we're two, four, five, six, seven, we go through experiences in our life that make us feel a certain way. And because of that feeling, we develop a core belief. And it serves us well at that age and at that time. But what Can ends up give, happening- give us an example? Like, would that be a belief like uh, about your worthiness or something like that? Be, it could be anything about your worthiness. So I'll give you an example. Um, it's not uncommon for me to work with a client that is coming to me and they're presenting problem is they second guess themselves a lot, mm -hmm. or they feel the need always to be getting other people's approval. And this uh, creates a lack of confidence. It's a ding on their self-esteem and they don't understand why. What might come out in a session is that 
they lived in a house where they didn't really see, you know, felt seen or valued or as significant or as an important member of the family. Um, or maybe they came from a large family, but they always felt alone. Or maybe um, they had parents that weren't great parents and they were put in a position to make a lot of core decisions on their own, but then were constantly told the decisions they were making were not the best ones, right? Okay. So there's all these little things. So let's just say hypothetically, you're seven years old and you don't have parents that are going to make you breakfast and lunch to take to school. Let's just use mm -hmm. this as an example. And so you become very resilient and you learn how to do these things on your own, but you also feel very alone. You feel unimportant because the person's not fulfilling a fundamental need. And then when you do feel that fundamental need, that person's walking in and say, why would you do it that way? Right. And now all of a sudden the core belief is, I don't know how to do things well. And I, I need other people's approach. Do you see what I'm saying? There's always mm -hmm. something that can cause a belief. But then when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, and you're trying to do something and you don't ever feel like you can just make that decision. And this is just one very simple example. Um, it's nice to be able to go back with the person to the moments that actually cause them to create that core belief and let them see they're not seven anymore. Right. You know, they're not okay. six anymore. Um, and it doesn't apply anymore. It's not relevant anymore and be able to break the cycle of that core belief and give them a new one to work with, one that they would prefer. So you find the source of where the experiences through hypnotherapy, relaxing the client well enough that they can travel back into mm -hmm. their past, identify the experiences where these core beliefs got cemented in them. Mm -hmm. And then you reprogram them. That's right. So at the very end of RTT, so RTT, like I said, is a hybrid model of all of these different modalities. To me, there's kind of like a secret formula. You have these bookends. So you have in a rapid transformational therapy session, you have some very um, fixed pieces, I would say. You have this regression piece where we're going back and we're excavating and you know investigating these core impressionable times which are always so fascinating to the client. They think they know what's going to come out. And then they're like, I, I can't believe I talked about, I don't remember even that moment at four years old in the kitchen, but I do now remember it. It's very interesting. So we do this very core regression at the beginning. And then mm -hmm. I use two tools to help them connect the dots. It's just a lot of question answering, you know, um, what did that scene cause you to believe about yourself and how does it connect to today's problem? I'm just asking them, I'm not making the connection for them. They get to make the connection and they can because the subconscious mind already knows the answer. It's the conscious mind that always protects us and doesn't give us that insight, right? And then at the end, at the other bookend, there's something called a reframe and a transformation. The mm -hmm. reframe is we're literally breaking down chip by chip Everything that was associated with that core belief, the shame, the stress, the anxiety, whatever it is. And I get to those core pieces in the clarity call beforehand. Like, what is it triggering for you? Mm -hmm. We kind of let that go and we do it in a very systematic way. And then the very end, we do something called a transformation. And the transformation is information we've taken from the session and from a pre-session call about what they want their life to look like without the problem. We get very specific. I ask them a lot about music and visualization and feelings and what does the feeling look like, sound like, feel like. So we can get very specific because the mind loves to work with pictures mm -hmm. and sounds. So we get very specific. When I do that transformation, I record it. And then I give it to them and I strongly ask them to listen to it for 21 days. And I work with them afterwards. So we're making sure they're installing that. But by listening to it for 21 days, we do program the brain to have a new thought. We rewire it. We refire it to think new things. We're all suggestible, right? What you right. eat, what you listen to, what you think of, they're all suggestions you give yourself all day long. You get to leave some suggestions to the side and pick up new ones, but you have to 
create a habit of that thinking. Right. So the, the recommendation is to listen to that recording as often as possible for 21 days. So that thought process becomes familiar. And how long would one of those recordings be? I like to try to keep it to like 13 minutes. Sometimes mm -hmm. depending on the person, they can be as long as 20. And the reason mm -hmm. why it might be as long as 20 is because a lot of my clients um, have been through trauma. You know, uh, to be honest with you, Stacey, we've all been through trauma, right? And that's a, another specialty of mine of really educating people on truly what trauma is, mm -hmm. because unfortunately we're so stuck and we're stuck because we don't recognize what we've gone through as trauma and that our body responds to it as such. So a lot of my clients not only come to me seeking peace or confidence or trying to break a habit, but they have physical ailments too that are part of the problem, right? Your body's physically manifested. So they have gut issues. Mm -hmm. When they have these triggers, they have bathrooms, you know, issues with the bathroom or their stomach bothers them or they have a hard time breathing or their, their heart rate goes high. So I can use two different healing modalities. One's called the healing vortex and one is called command cell therapy that I can implement into the transformation that really instructs, commands, compels the body to function back to its original blueprint before they made those core beliefs and before their body started responding to it. Right. So if I need to get that in, it'll be a little bit of a longer recording, but very impactful. Okay. And is this all done via Zoom? Can be. So luckily my training was out of London. So I was trained um, to do everything online and I have, and I have clients in Canada. I have clients all over the United States. I'm right outside of New York city in mm -hmm. New Jersey, New Jersey clients. Sometimes they want that in-person touch and I'm very, very happy to do that. So I can do that. I've gone to people's homes. They can come to my home, um, but it can also be equally effective done over zoom. And how long would, would it be when you talk about the bookends from start to finish, how long a process would this be? So one RTT session is two hours. It might mm -hmm. be a little bit less depending on what we need to put in the middle of the bookends, right? Mm -hmm. um, I do a clarity call prior. Mm -hmm. And I find it to be a very integral and very important part. It's not a required piece of RTT. This is part of my own coaching program. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> probably a week or two prior to an RTT session, I do what's called a clarity call. Mm -hmm. That's usually 75 minutes or so. And mm -hmm. that's when we really investigate what it is that is hindering them. What is it that they want to work on? We get very specific. It's not the whole kitchen sink. We want mm -hmm. one piece. And so we get very, very clear on that. And that takes about 75 minutes. So when we go into the RTT session, I have a very good idea of what some of the things are that I'm going to need to implement into this recipe, if you will. Right. So I do the clarity call, the RTT session is two hours. Mm -hmm. And then in this particular program, there's a coaching call seven days after that. And then another coaching call 14 days after the first coaching call. And that's really designed to help them in re continue to install that new belief system and talk about triggers that may have come up. And were you reverting back to the old core belief? How are you doing going towards the new belief? Mm -hmm. And how is that all working? So kind of a full circle. I see. Okay. So for my people specifically, Stacy, mm -hmm. these are women who are in the throes of high conflict divorce. Most of them come to me with problems like either being triggered by the behavior of their ex-husband. Um, many of them are afraid to move forward. I have a subset of clients who are still living with their ex and mm -hmm. really living as a doormat, um, totally reliant on the ex to make the next move, not sort of um, finding any of their power or their um, agency in this process, just reacting to whatever happens. How could RTT help them? When would you employ it? Well, I guess the real question is, is the why, right? So if you have somebody like you just described that doesn't have the agency to 
Mm -hmm. you know, embrace their power. Why is that? Is it fear of something? Is it a lack of confidence? Um, has their, I, I'm very familiar with narcissism and, and high conflict divorce. My parents had a high conflict divorce. So the question is, is, um, was the person quote unquote, be down enough emotionally in the process of the marriage that they've lost a sense of themselves or they've lost their voice or they've lost their confidence, but they had it prior. Cause I know that that exists for so many. I we would cannot... give that a, a profound yes for most. Yeah. Of so I think we need to go back to the beginning and find mm -hmm. when, when did, when did you lose the power and how do mm -hmm. we go back and find your original power? This is the beautiful thing. I do this one, if it's required, this one mm -hmm. piece of the program called installing the cheerleader. And during installing the cheerleader, we go back and I, I remind my clients, when you were an infant and you were learning how to walk, you would take that step, you would fall, you might even laugh. There was no self-judgment. You got right back up and you just took the next step. Every single time you fell, you just got right back up. People were maybe sitting around and encouraging you, but you wouldn't have even needed that. You would have just gotten right back up because there was no inner critic saying mm -hmm. to you, what are you doing? Taking a step. You can't take a step. Get up, go. We didn't mm -hmm. have it then. The inner critic develops much later. Mm -hmm. So I love to get people to go back and visualize those moments, those moments where there was no inner critic, where confidence was high, remind them that it's still there. It's just very dormant, as you said. Exactly. And They're just a we, little pinched off from it. Yeah. And we go back and we, we unearth when the core belief came up that their voice was not important anymore, or their opinion didn't matter, or they lost that self-confidence, they may go back to the age of 30. You don't have to go back to infancy or toddlerhood. Mm -hmm. there can, I have had plenty of times where people have gone way back and then the next set seems they're 35 years old. You know, it can be a mix, but we're mm -hmm. really looking to go back to those impressionable times where the feelings associated with the core belief of I'm not enough or I'm not worthy started to really creep in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I'm going to okay. ask you one more a typical mm -hmm. thing. The fear of retaliation. That is mm -hmm. something my clients struggle a lot with so that they don't make decisions that are in their best interest and the, in the best interest of the children because they are mired by the fear of retaliation. So, now, you know, I'm curious to how you work with your clients on that. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense of, is the fear, there is gonna be true fear. Yeah, there right. is. there is some legitimacy to it. So when there is legitimacy to that fear of retaliation, um, the way that I work with it is I actually go there. Like, let's actually go to that worst case scenario. You do X in support of yourself and he then does Y. Now what? How are you gonna feel? What actions will you take? What are we gonna think on purpose about this so that we get the best possible outcome? Um, that's usually how we're, we manage to navigate that fear. We go there and decide in advance how we, how we can deal with it. And for many of my clients, that means calling 911. Uh -huh. And that's when things actually, what we thought would make it so much worse, makes it so much better. And that's how it was for me when I finally mm -hmm. did that. It's ev everything went calm after that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was safe. So, so here's the interesting thing. Safety is a big thing that I work with on people, right? So when people come to me and they say, my biggest issue is I have severe anxiety. Mm -hmm. I usually say to them, anxiety stems from fear. So what are you afraid of? And it usually comes to, I don't feel safe. And mm -hmm. it could be that you don't feel safe physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, because we know narcissism brings in a lot of psychological terror. And then the question is, is when did that start? Did that start in this marriage? Did this start younger? You know, and we can go back and try to find 
times where the client made this agreement that they're not safe or that safety is not available to them. Mm-hmm. And it often comes in at a very young age. And so if we can go back and get them to realize that um, they are safe internally, because you and I talked about this the other day, when you work with your clients on the thoughts, the feelings, their actions, and then their outcomes, there's like this thin myelin sheath, like this very thin invisible layer, in my opinion, that lays on top of the thought. And the, the thin layer is your core belief, right? So if you're already coming into that with a core belief that you're not even aware of, because it's a whisper, it is in your subconscious, it's not a loud resounding, I'm not safe. It's just a feeling, right? Because core beliefs are really rooted in these feelings. If you already come into this, whereas I don't feel safe, and maybe this particular husband saw that vulnerability mm-hmm. and created a scenario at first to love bomb you and realize that you feel safe, even Mm -hmm. though it's uh, not real, right? That's right. So in that particular case, it was taken advantage of, even when you couldn't see it, it, nobody can ever blame themselves for being in a relationship with a narcissist because they are masterful. Mm-hmm. right? Masterful manipulators. Um, and I use narcissism a lot because I think a lot of high conflict divorces probably Absolutely. have that common denominator. So if that was kind of seen by the master manipulator as a weakness, they're going to strike, right? So we need to go back to getting you to the core, the root, the reason that you didn't feel safe as a young child, And when Mm -hmm. we can recognize that, I'm able to get them under hypnosis to see, but I'm not seven anymore. And Mm -hmm. I am an adult and I am all these other things and it doesn't resonate. They don't connect anymore. And I can be strong and I can be safe and I can be these things. Mm -hmm. So that's, does that answer your question? I feel like that's where it would come in. Yeah, I I really want my clients to feel self-protective and not only for themselves, but as parents, they want their children to become self-sufficient and self-protective people. You know, we think as a parent, it's our job to protect our kids, but really it's our job to teach them to be Mm self-protective. And so here's the other thing, and this is really a subset, but I think it just gives people a vibe of who I am. And so I'm going to share it. I'm all about resilience. And I've done a lot of workshops on resilience. And I have one in particular that I developed called the road to resilience. And the concept behind this workshop is this, when we're young and you and I are relatively the same age, we're in our fifties. When we're young, we're taught very simply if this feels good, it's a good experience. And if that feels anything other than good, then it's labeled bad, Mm -hmm. right? So anytime we have any kind of feeling that's undesirable about a situation, we label it bad only because that's what we've been taught. You even see it in Disney, like everything that's not feeling good is basically bad or neutral. But the reality is, is that our good experiences in life, the things that bring us joy, contentment, all of the good feelings, bliss, they're beautiful. And I see them much, very much as respite, right? All of these other experiences, the ones that we would not label good, Mm -hmm. they are designed to crack you wide open and to get you on your knees, And when you're on your knees, that's when you have this opportunity to evolve, shift, grow, transform. It's the biggest gift you can get because you get to transform every single time you come up against these hurdles into the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, in our case, 5.0 version of ourselves. And I do see it happen every decade. I don't think that that's a coincidence, Mm -hmm. but we label them as bad, but they're actually the greatest gift we've ever had. And if we don't go through the challenge and we're constantly trying to avoid the pain and circumvent it, we can't, we can't evolve. 
right? Agreed. Agreed. So, and we also it's can't the, build the our discomfort. The discomfort is the currency of growth. Oh yeah, and it's the current it, you have to go up against, right? To get through the what I call the sticky, scary forest, right? Okay. And so when we circumvent it, which a lot of people are very skilled at doing, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't give them the ability to develop the resilience muscle. And if you don't develop the resilience muscle, you're not per fully prepared for the next hurdle because there will always be hurdles. We okay. think um, when something challenging comes up against us, it shouldn't be happening. And so we fight it and we say, this shouldn't be happening. And that's where a lot of the angst comes from because you're literally going up against uh -huh. what is happening. Uh -huh. You're not surrendering Argu to it. Arguing with reality. You're arguing with reality. So you're not able to build that resilience muscle and prepare yourself for the next hurdle because there will be one. Mm -hmm. When you can learn to do that, when you can learn to see every challenge as divinely designed for you, you're also teaching that to your children. Definitely. And teaching your children how to build that resilience muscle early on, I know we can all agree as parents, we're constantly trying to help our kids circumvent pain and discomfort. Always, yes. yeah. always, in every situation, mm -hmm. always. So we're not giving our children the inherent ability to experience adversity, learn what it is, build that resilience muscle. And so we have a group of kids coming up against adversity and they crumble. They don't know what to do with it, which is a whole Absolutely. other of wax, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think that resilience is incredibly important on all fronts because you're going to need it your entire life. Yeah. And, and frankly, we're not going to be around forever to keep our kids free of pain. And so they, best, they're never, they can't they avoid it. How. That's right. It's, it's a normal part of life. Exactly. It is a normal part of life. And until we surrender to that, it's a tough road. Yeah, and you and can't really is, get the peace that you want. Kids, kids are actually very skilled at riding waves of pain when allowed to. They're good mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. And 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 the earlier they can learn, it's a natural part of the re, you know the course of life. The easier it will be for them to navigate it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, so, Stacy, tell people how they can get a hold of you, what your availability is like, what it would cost them to do RTT, because I think it would be really useful to so many of my clients. Okay. So, I have a website. It's called flipyourmindset.com because that's okay. really what I try to do. I flip the mindset of people and get them to see their challenges through a different lens. Mm -hmm. um, they can go to my website. And on my website, I always have a free discovery call and they can just sign up, right? They'll set, get access to my calendar and they can get just dropped into the next available appointment. And that's an hour where they can just kind of offload what's going on. They can get a feel for me. We can listen and engage. And if they feel like I have something of value to them, they can take the next steps. They can also follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram and on Facebook, both with just my name. I don't make it complicated, which is Stacy Urig, U-H-R-I-G. Um, and as far as the RTT program, a lot of people do it certain, you know, different ways. Some people just offer RTT. I don't see a huge benefit to that. So I right. offer it in a 30 day program, which includes what we discussed before the clarity call, the RTT session, mm -hmm. and then two subsequent coaching sessions. And it can be done between usually 30 and 45 days, depending on timing, but it's mm -hmm. a, it's a hard hit. It's an intensive that's $750 us. Um, and it's well worth it because I have plenty of clients coming out of it literally transformed. It was a very smart, very smart name for this program, the rapid transformational therapy, because it really is quick and they really are getting the piece that they're seeking. And there's that, that's invaluable. I, I can't think of a better way to get super prepared for litigation. I mm. think that would be oh. so valuable for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because 
And I know, I know you go over this, you know, when we have that anxiety, show me somebody that's not going into litigation with anxiety. Okay. Exactly. Forget the fear piece, just the physical anxiety, because I am someone who from the ages of probably 13 to 35. And when I say suffer, I don't say it lately, like really suffered from anxiety and I'm treated anxiety just naturally yields to depression. And I don't see these as mental states. I see them as physical states, right? So the anxiety is a sensation in your body that mm -hmm. stops you in your track. However, it is, it shows up in your body. Um, and that depression, as we all know, causes inability to focus, lack of motivation, procrastination, you look at a blank screen, you're normally very high functioning. You just can't function. It's all physical to me. Mm -hmm. uh, show me a person that's going into litigation that doesn't naturally feel that way because there's fear and Absolutely. discomfort and there's all the unknown. Yeah. So how do you find a way to figure out what it is that you're fearful of? Basically tell it it's not true that you are safe, that you do have an opportunity here and really retrain your brain not to think what it thinks that yields that physical reaction. Does so that, that make sense? Can, absolutely. So that you can perform optimally. And that's so 100%. important in litigation. Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you want to optimize you yourself as a professional, as a parent, but very much so as a litigant, like that's, that's your time to be a rock star. A hundred percent. And I yeah. can say that from personal experience because I've yeah. been there and I've done it without it. And I'm going to be going into it again with it. And I know it's going to be a very, very different experience. Okay. Okay. So Stacy, thank you for your time. I'm sure you're going to hear from my clients and I look so forward to collaborating with you in the future.